Even if you have never read the Bible before, I'll guarantee you, you have heard all of these Bible passages. You are the light of the world. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You cannot serve both God and money. Which of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Do not judge, lest you be judged. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, and pay no attention to the plank that's in your own eye? Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. The wise man built his house upon the rock, but the foolish man built his house upon the sand. By their fruit you will know them. And how about the most famous prayer of all time? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into tempt temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. All of these passages and many more just like them or very similar to them are found in one section of the Bible that's known as the Sermon on the Mount. The greatest discourse of all time, the greatest sermon of all, all time found in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And everything written in Matthew 5 through 7 is written in red except for the first two verses of chapter 5 at the beginning of the sermon and the last two verses at the end of the sermon. At the beginning of the sermon, and seeing the multitudes, Matthew writes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, he, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth, and he taught them. And then the last two passages in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 28 through 29, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority not as one of the scribes. In other words, this wasn't just a really, really good TED talk. This was Jesus as the Son of God speaking with authority. And the Sermon on the Mount is the heart of everything Jesus came to say to us. And, and I am convinced after a lot of prayer and study about our world and where we are right now that the message of the Sermon on the Mount, the principles and the values that Jesus delivered in this sermon almost 2,000 years ago are still just as relevant today as they were then. And, and what Jesus said in this Sermon on the Mount, I think the world needs to hear it today. The church needs to hear this today to find healing in our personal lives, in our families, and even in our land. And so for the next several weeks, I'm going to be preaching through the Sermon on the Mount, these three chapters that are jam-packed with the greatest principles that God has ever uttered to mankind. And so the sermon starts out with the Beatitudes. They're called the Beatitudes because every sentence starts with the word blessed. And during much of the Middle Ages, the, the Bible was only translated uh, through the Latin and the Latin word for blessed is beati. And so these became known as the beatitudes. And to say that someone is beati is to say they're blessed, is to say that they are happy. So when you see that word blessed, it means happy. Happy are you, happy are you. All through the first 12 verses of the Sermon on the Mount. So the idea of blessedness in the Bible is a little bit different, and the idea of happiness here is a little different than we typically think of on the surface level. Because we oftentimes think of happiness as being an emotion. I feel good about something. And that's a certain kind of happiness. But this is not the happiness Jesus is talking about. Although it produces good feelings, happiness in the Bible has to do with finding the path that God wants you to go on. And once you find the path of God, the path He wants you to follow, there is where you'll find true happiness and contentment, the peace that surpasses all understanding, the joy of the Lord that we just sang about. When you find where God wants you to go, and you can only know that through His Word. And when you find it, when you get on that path, not the path the world lays out, but the path that God lays out, you're going to find supreme happiness in, in your life. 
And today I'm going to be talking about the first half of the Beatitudes, and next week I'll talk about the second half of the Beatitudes. Back in 2014 I spoke or did an entire series on the Beatitudes. It was an eight lesson series. I took them one at a time. But I'm only going to take four today and, and four next week, and so give you more of the highlights of them this week. As we start this season of learning on the Sermon on the Mount. Let's look at the first Beatitude found in verse 3. Blessed, beati, uh, happy, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now who in the world says uh, something like this, that, uh, th that a person is happy if they're poor in anything? I mean typically we think of poor as being someone that's needy. Someone that's in a state of life that where there's poverty. And so what is he talking about here? People who are poor in spirit are those who realize that apart from God they can't have happiness. True down deep happiness. You can have some fleeting times of happiness. But unless you understand uh, that, that without God you are lost in your sins, without the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your life, you're lost for all eternity, you can't be happy. So it's, it's all about knowing that, that only Jesus can satisfy our deepest needs in life. That's what it's all about when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. That is, on my own, by myself, I can't save myself. I need the blood of Jesus and to, to discover that, to become poor in spirit, that you're a beggar, that you're a debtor, that there's nothing you could ever do or nor enough of it that could ever cause God to be indebted to you, but you're, you're simply relying on the blood of Jesus Christ. And so you're poor in spirit. I'll tell you some people who understand this beatitude maybe better than most. That's those people who have gone through some kind of addiction. There's some kind of 12-step program. And the first thing you have to admit in a 12-step program is that you are powerless to control your own life. You need someone, you need God in your life from a Christian perspective. That's, that they, it's not just some power, some higher power, it's God. He is the power. He is the one, and true, one true God. And so the poor in spirit admit that salvation can't be earned. We're all beggars, again. We're all debtors. A couple of good biblical examples of this particular beatitude, the poor in spirit. One is found in Luke chapter 18 verses 9 through 14 where we find the Pharisee and the tax collector. Listen to what went on, what transpired. To some who were confident of their own righteousness, some are, some think that they can be good enough to save themselves. They're not, those are not the poor in spirit people that Jesus refers to, but there are people like that. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And tax collectors were loathed in the first century. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance in his humility he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. That's an example of someone who understands to be in poor, to, to be blessed, you must be poor in spirit. That this guy's bragging about all the goodness in his life, and I'm telling you, I have to fall at the foot of the cross and ask for your mercy. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, Jesus said, went home justified before God. Not the one who thought he had it all together, was following all the rules. He wasn't the one that would go home justified in the eyes of God. But this man who, he was poor in spirit. He understood that without the grace of God, without the forgiveness that's brought through Jesus Christ, I cannot find happiness. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. And I think of Paul in Philippians chapter 3 and how... Um, for effect, he talked about all the things he had done in his life, all the good qualities in his life. Very few people, maybe no one, could ever bring forth a pedigree to match the, the Apostle Paul. He said, I've done all these things, 
But then he comes to the end. He says, but I consider them garbage that I may, um, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. You can't get much clearer than that. To be poor in spirit means that I'm completely, utterly lost. Regardless of how good I might think I am, regardless of what family I may have come from, regardless of how much money I may have, my looks, my power, my fame, I can never be good enough to earn what Christ has done for me. That's the poor in spirit people. Then the second beatitude is found in verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now he's not talking about the kind of mourning we do when a loved one dies. He's not talking about the kind of mourning you would see at the typical funeral home. I mean, if you lost a loved one and you were at the funeral home mourning, maybe you're crying, you're grieving, and someone walks up to you and says, it's so glad to see you so happy. Well, you'd be offended at something like that, right? He's not talking about that kind of mourning when it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. He's talking about mourning over the sin in our lives that separates us from God and the comfort that we get in knowing that Jesus came and took care of that for us. That's what he's talking about here. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You see, I can't find comfort thinking, well, I've got to be good enough to earn it. I think a lot of people, a lot of people who have at one time in their life been very faithful in their commitment to God, somewhere down the line they got crossed up and started thinking, I'm too sinful to deserve the grace of God. And, and I, just can't, I just can't be saved because of the, the type of person I am. They lost track of the fact that blessed are those who mourn. That is to mourn that you're not what all you want to be. That your sins put Jesus on the cross. But to be comforted in the fact that even though you don't deserve it, you have the unmerited favor of God, His grace that He offers, if you'll just accept it. If you'll confess your faith in Christ, understand the sin in your life that separates you from God and mourn about that. And you repent of your sins. That's mourning. I confess, Lord. The word confess means to agree with. When we confess something to God, we're saying, God, I agree with you. Your way is right, but how I'm living is wrong. But to find comfort in knowing that Jesus took care of even my sins. He's talking about repentance and the comfort that comes from it. And Jesus is saying that only those who admit their sin and mourn about it will be comforted. And sin is serious business. It's not something we can take lightly. And God didn't take it lightly. You say grace is free. Well, no, not really. It's free to us, but it wasn't free to God. Because Jesus, His only begotten Son, came and paid our sin debt for us. And when you think about Jesus on that cross because of your sin, when I think of Jesus on that cross because of my sin, that should cause me to mourn, but to understand, wow, God loves me that much that He was willing to even go that far. Far, far to take care of my, my sin debt. Maybe the best example of this kind of mourning in the Bible is David. Listen to how David mourned his own sin and how he wrote about it in one of his Psalms, Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are the one uh, is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, that is, when I didn't come clean with my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. You ever gone through a season in your life like that where you're, you felt like your bones were wasting away because you knew you were outside the will of God, and you felt awful about it? For day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. That's the Holy Spirit working on a person's life to bring that kind of conviction. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. 
Forgiveness is a powerful, powerful word. It's one of the most comforting words that in the human language. And we should mourn over our own sins. We should also mourn over the sins we see in the world because we see a lot of them today. And only when our heart breaks over the sin that's in our own lives will our hearts break over the sins that we see in the world. The psalmist said in Psalm 119 verse 136, streams of tears flow from my eyes for your law is not obeyed. And Jeremiah who's called the weeping prophet said in Jeremiah 8 21, since my people are crushed, I am crushed. He, he mourned over the, what his people were going through. I mourn and honor grips, horror grips me. Then chapter 9 verse 1, Jeremiah says, Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the sins of my people. So it should cause all of us to mourn when we see a brother or a sister living in sin. Not angry at them, but to mourn. To know that they're not receiving the best that God has for them as long as they're living that way. For us to understand we're not receiving the best God has for us if we're not following His path and finding the blessings, the, the Beatitudes. Every revival that I can think of in the Bible, going back in the Old Testament especially, several years ago I preached on all the revivals in the Bible. And every, every revival story in the Bible was preached by someone after they had gone through a season of mourning and remorse. And when Jesus returns, mourning is going to end. Revelation 21 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. Then we go to the third beatitude found in verse 5. And each of these, you're, you're building momentum with them. It's like I saw a guy one time doing uh, an act on America's Got Talent. And it was these rings, and he would start at one ring, and he would swing uh, with his hands on the rings from one to the next. He had to have enough speed and momentum to get to the next one. If he didn't have enough momentum, he wouldn't get to it. Went all the way across the stage on those rings. And, and that's the way the Beatitudes are. We're, we're building momentum. The, the better we live out these Beatitudes one at a time, we build more and more, more, and more momentum so that we can we get to this ring. It enables us to, do, to get to the next ring. We have enough momentum there, we get to the next ring. But the third Beatitude is found in verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, the word meek... Meekness is not something the typical person would put on a resume. Because people have a misunderstanding today of what the word meek means. Many people characterize a meek person as one who is easily intimidated, soft, cowardly, passive, weak. But in Jesus' day it didn't mean that at all. In Jesus' day meek referred to power under control had the idea of a wild horse, and that horse is caught, and it's tamed, and it can be governed by a bridle, a pull to the left or a pull to the right. The horse is much stronger than the rider, but it's meek. And oftentimes the word meek in modern translations, most of the time the modern translations don't even translate this word meek as meek, because it has so much baggage behind it, people thinking of weakness, they usually translated as gentle. But a meek person was one who had tamed themselves or had allowed God to tame them and how to exercise self-control self and self-discipline. You'll sometimes hear the phrase, oh he or she is meek as a mouse. But that's not how the ancient Greeks would have understood that word. They would have said he's meek as a lion. Hail, hail, lion of Judah. How powerful you are. And think of it like a highly trained MMA fighter. You ever watch one of those guys fight? Those guys are tough. They're the definition of tough. It's like one of those guys goes out and some 
weak-minded person insults him or insults his wife and and so he could tear the guy apart he knows he could do it but he chooses not to it's like a person who is a, a specialist in the martial arts and they they have all that power but they have it under control and one uh, um, martial arts master told me one time in martial arts what you're thinking of is, is you have all this power but the greatest power you have is to not use the power to its full for, force for, for harm is to use it for is to harness it and use it for good blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth they are under control under the control of the spirit they can't do it on their own they t- totally give themselves to the Lord they find the path they need to be on and God leads them all the days of their lives. And when you're meek, life becomes less about conquest and more about finding who you are in Christ and the sufficiency that you have in Him, not in your own power. Colossians 3.12, Therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. We should clothe ourselves with it. And in our world today, people want to get everybody back. Someone screams, and some, the next person wants to scream louder. Someone hits, the next person wants to hit harder. Someone insults, and then the next person wants to insult in an even greater way. Thus, the condition we find our world in today. I know of no other places in the Bible collectively where we find more biblical principles that are needed to be lived out in the lives of people, not only in the church, but in the world today, than Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. That's why I'm going to take every word of it, all three chapters over the next several weeks, and talk about it, because it's so powerful, because it's so needed. The last beatitude I'm going to deal with today is verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. A hunger for righteousness means that you're hungry for God and His rule in your life. Have you ever been hungry? I'm talking about really hungry. There are many people out throughout this world who know what it means to be hungry to the point where you haven't eaten for days. And my mother and daddy, I remember them talking about growing up in a mining camp and, and going, you know, literally days not eating and how hard that was now when you're that hungry when you're on the verge of starvation you can't think about anything but getting something to eat and something to drink it completely controls your mind you're preoccupied with food I've got to have something to eat. that self-preservation instinct kicks in listen to how the psalmist said it in Psalm 42 verses 1 through 2 And how if we can take that same passion and need and desire for physical food and translate that over into a need, a hunger for God, this is how it sounds. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? When can I go dine in the presence of the Almighty God? And the psalmist said in Psalm 63, verses 1 through 5, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name I will lift up my hands, and I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. To hunger for righteousness means that you desire God, and if you have nothing else in life but God, you are satisfied with that. God's values are established in every area of your life. The person who hungers for God doesn't compartmentalize God, but makes God the center of their entire life. It's not, well, it's, it's 
God first, family second, work third, friends fourth. You know, it's God at the center of all of that. God is the hub. And every other part of your life is just a spoke coming off of that one centerpiece, which is the Almighty God. Righteousness is something a true kingdom dweller craves. And that's what Jesus is talking about all through the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about how kingdom residents are to act in the kingdom. The kingdom is the church. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the head of the kingdom. And we as the church, we are the kingdom that belongs to Jesus Christ. You can't have a kingdom without a king. Jesus is our king. You can't have a king without a kingdom. And so Jesus established his church. Then he said, if you want to dwell in my kingdom, here are the rules for living. But you can't do them on your own. You don't have the power to do them on your own. You're going to have to become, you're going to have to be, uh, be hungry for it. Hungry for it. It will change your very life. It will change our world. The more people we can get to live out these principles. Jesus says there only, there's only one thing that will satisfy your deepest needs in life. Matthew 6, which is the mantra verse for the entire Sermon on the Mount. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things, that is all the things the world needs to be happy, beati, you'll find them. Seek first the kingdom of God, all in His righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. And the things we hunger for more than God, whatever that might be, whether it's food, drink, whether it's money, sex, power, fame, prestige, whatever. Whatever you hunger for, if you hunger for those things more than you hunger for God, those things will eventually starve you to death. Because all of those temporary things are nothing but junk food compared to the eternal food that's offered through Jesus Christ. Unless you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you'll never really be filled. I'm going to conclude by going to the Old Testament and reading some Old Testament Beatitudes to you. And if you're not a Christian specifically right now, I want you to understand that your sin, just like my sin, separates us from God. And that has to be dealt with. Jesus, God just didn't just wink at our sins. Oh, that's no big deal. I'll just forgive it. No, He sent His only begotten Son to die so that our sins could be forgiven. By His righteousness we are saved, not by our own righteousness. And that should compel us to want to live a righteous life because of the righteous death He died on our behalf. But as you listen to these verses, I'd like for you to get in touch with where you are in your relationship with God or if you don't have any kind of relationship with God. And as a, a, a fellow believer, as one who has already named Christ as your Savior by doing those things I suggested earlier that God says we should do, and that is to confess our faith in Jesus, repent of our sins, and be baptized, have our sins washed away by the blood of Jesus, not by our own goodness, not by water. No such thing as water regeneration. It's just a command of God to come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ in some mysterious way that even we can't understand. The psalmist said in Psalm 32, 1 through 6, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Now here's the poor in spirit part. Then I acknowledged my sin. You got to acknowledge your sin. Church member, you're living in sin. You got to acknowledge that to find this peace, to find this happiness, to find this beati, to really live out the beatitudes. You got to acknowledge your sin. If you're lost, you've got to acknowledge your sin. That you'll never be good enough, no matter how much you do. You'll never be good enough on your own. You've you got to have Christ. You've got to rely on Christ. Then I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. You ever been forgiven when you really messed up? Something you said, something you did, and the freedom that you felt just knowing that you'd been forgiven, it's powerful. 
and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. And God bless all of you.